Um, all right. Well, speaking of auto log capabilities, uh, we're here to talk about private cloud security, some vendor secrets and hypervisor competitive differences. Whenever you put vendor and secret in the title, it means that you're bound to get a lot of vendors in the audience. So uh, I've, I've seen some. I'm sure there's some, uh, several of you from end user organizations as well. Um, I have a, a lot of slides to, to, to run through today, so uh, what I wanted to do and what I do in a lot of my presentations is try to give you a lot of things to think about, uh, hopefully, and uh, uh, some information to take back to the office. I have a lot of examples, too, uh, where there are some deficiencies, and, and what I'll be doing is, is talking about some best practices around virtualization and cloud security, as well as um, giving you some tables that do some comparisons between Zen, uh, Hyper-V, and VMware vSphere. Uh, when it comes to uh, security uh, feature differentiation. So uh, rather than beat around the bush, I'll go ahead and get started. Here's your uh, standard deal about what Gartner does. I think most of you are familiar with Gartner. Uh, I had come over to Gartner from the Burton Group acquisition in January, and basically what uh, we are, what Burton Group is now is called the Gartner IT Professional Service. So what we do is write uh, tactical research, which is typically papers anywhere from 25 to 40 pages that go very in-depth on specific issues of techno technology architecture, uh, best practices, uh, vendor assessments, et cetera. So the, the agenda for today is, is to really run through four, four, th four areas, the hypervisor security comparison. I'm going to start off doing that first. Then I'm going to start looking at some of the warts of type 2 client hypervisors, because uh, these things are out there. There's, there's a, most organizations have some type 2 hypervisors. Uh, are uh, in their infrastructure somewhere, often but used by uh, folks such as developers and many IT professionals. And, and there's a lot of organizations looking at the Type 2 client hypervisor to support some of their virtual desktop scenarios as well. So I want to look at, at some of the differences there, uh, summarize with some challenge and solutions, then wrap it up and, and then get into a Q&A. So let's start with some, some just uh, a higher level uh, security comparison of the different uh, hypervisors. And the way this is broken down is this, is, uh, this was based on the Burton Group evaluation criteria for server virtualization hypervisors. We look at several areas of uh, not just uh, scalability, performance, management, security, networking, et cetera, uh, as part of a holistic assessment of different virtualization platforms. And what I'm focusing on here is all of the security aspects of that assessment. Now, what we have, what we do with the features is we break them into three different stratifications. Uh, the first one being required, which is things we consider to be absolute necessities. Uh, for example, a platform should have role-based access controls, very rich role-based access controls, so I can delegate administrative duties. That's something that's very important to most enterprises and larger, large-scale enterprise environments. Uh, preferred features would be nice to have. They typically result in better experience, but they're not necessarily a deal breaker for an implementation. Oftentimes, you can uh, you can get by without some of those. Uh, optional features are often use case driven. Uh, EAL common criteria certification, for example, is something we list as an optional feature. Some organizations, it's, it's a requirement. Um, other organizations, it's not necessary. So again, here's just a, a link to uh, the document that describes all of that in uh, uh, greater detail. I think, it's, uh, I think it's about 63 pages. So if you, you're having trouble sleeping one night, I mean, I, it's, it's highly recommended. Uh, you'll be in sleep in about five minutes. Okay, I want to go ahead and, and, get, and start going through these. Uh, there, the, the presentation does get more interesting, but there are some boring tables in here. I'm just warning you. And uh, what I wanted to do is just give you some details on how each of these uh, platforms uh, stack up. You know, I, I, first of all, directory service integration. Again, you think today these are, these are things you could just take for granted that I'm going to integrate with a directory service, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, Zen Server 5, for example, did not have active directory integration. Uh, it wasn't until the 5.5 release that the directory service integration was in, the, it was in that uh, core product. So sometimes just you, you, you assume a larger version of, a, of software and you think, well, I can just take for granted directory service. Not always the case. Again, though, as, you, as you can see, all three hypervisors do integrate with, uh, with Active Directory today at a minimum. Uh, many support LDAP as well. Role-based access controls is something that is present in all three of the, uh, the products. Uh, VMware has had a very good role-based access control and, and admin delegation engine for some time. Uh, that is uh, through the vCenter management server. And again, if I'm looking for more uh, granularity of, of uh, uh, restrictions and roles access, uh, say down to the hypervisor level, that's where folks have looked at other solutions such as High Trust uh, to fill in some of those gaps. Uh, Citrix Zen Server 5.5, they initially uh, introduced role-based access control, but it was through the lab management interface that they have. That's part of their 
uh, originally their OEM with VM Logics, and now it's the acquisition of VM Logics. In Zen Server 5.6, the role-based access control was, was built into Zen Center, so it's a uh, it's much richer uh, improvement over what Citrix had previously. In, in terms of Microsoft Hyper-V, role-based access control for Hyper-V is configured using auth authorization manager or ASMAN policies. I would love to know which intern actually came up with the name ASMAN, but uh, uh, maybe the Microsoft guys in the audience can, can let us know that. Uh, there, there's quite a bit of information here. I have the link that gets you so, into some of the more details on, on ASMAN, but you can see that uh, with Hyper-V R2, it was updated so I can have local RBAC policies. They're no longer discarded once SCVMM assumes control of Hyper-V's physical host. So that was an important update that came into Hyper-V R2 when it came to role-based access controls. Otherwise, there was some discrepancy when I initiated SCVMM to take over uh, management and delegation of Hyper-V hosts. OK, again, a lot of these are basic. We'll, when we get into preferred features, the, 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 we'll hopefully get a little bit beyond some of the no-brainers here. Management traffic has to be secured. You know, that's necessity for, for most management platforms today. And, and all these vendors will do SSL uh, encryption at, at a minimum to make sure that I have a security of my management traffic. Security logging and auditing of administrative actions. Again, for, for us, it's very important that any type of enterprise virtualization solution has an administrative change logging capability so that there's an audit trail for all administrative actions. This is something that is, uh, you can see is supported on all three of these uh, platforms today. Uh, there's just so, some details there on the implementation. I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to just necessarily read all these to you, but again, you can see uh, the details there with the hyperlinks uh, that were appropriate that I uh, had available. There should be vendor provided hardening guidelines. And that is something that all three of these platforms do offer. And it's, it's, if, you, if you've seen it, again, the, the hardening guidelines are, are very rich for all three of the hypervisors. If you, if you haven't seen it, I, I definitely t uh, recommend you take a look at them. Uh, VMware uh, earlier this year released an updated version of their hardening guidelines uh, that had been based on uh, uh, VI uh, 3.5, and they are updated for vSphere 4. Again, Citrix offers it for Zen Server. Microsoft has a Hyper-V security guide as well. And again, they, they're all pretty good, in my opinion. They have quite a bit of inf information. Uh, an integrated firewall should be present as well. As you can see, again, all of the virtualization hypervisors that are profiled here uh, does have uh, a fire integrated or local firewall capabilities. Again, some are, some are richer than others. Uh, in the case of VMware, uh, last year the vShield zones feature was added to the, the, uh, the hypervisor architecture so that I had additional zoning capabilities with inside the virtual infrastructure. There's still work that needs to be done on, on the zoning architecture. For example, in the case of vSphere, there's, there's not a lot of intelligence that exists between zoning restrictions and orchestration. Uh, DRS, for example, when it decides where to place a VM, only looks at two things, available CPU and available memory. Uh, I'm not taking into account I.O., I'm not taking into account security considerations, uh, data export restrictions, for example, any type of privacy considerations on where a VM can reside, say, on a larger cluster, uh, that's not part of that intelligence, at least not yet. And VMware understands that for uh, richer orchestration, I just can't be thinking about computed memory. I have to think about other technical criteria and other non-technical factors, such as security zoning restrictions. So again, they've gotten some of that feedback. I think they'll have that in there eventually. Configuration file integrity checking. This is where we, we do have issues with, with all three of the hypervisors. And right now, we don't see this as required, but this is more of a preferred feature. So this is something that uh, we see as a nice to have when you're, when you're looking at server virtualization platforms. So I should be able to validate the integrity of my virtual machine configuration files, and ideally be able to do the same thing for my virtual hard disk files. So if I'm, say, deploying a new VM from a template, I'm, I'm assured of the, of the authenticity of that actual uh, source image file. That's not something that I can do with any of the platforms today. They all do require some third-party add-ons. Hyper-V does give you uh, protection of your core system files as part of Windows file protection. Uh, VMware does have, an, on the surface, it does have some capabilities. The, the actual uh, full-blown ESX console it does include SHA-1 sum, but we don't consider SHA-1 uh, a secure enough hashing algorithm to say, okay, yes, uh, you know, VMware is good to go when it comes to integrity checking of the actual configuration files. So right now I would need to go third party uh, to satisfy that type of requirement. Centralized hypervisor patch management is something that all of the platforms can do. 
And moving in here now to other things such as uh, memory state. If I'm doing live migration, I want to ensure that my memory state is secured while it's in live migration transit. Now, what's important here on, uh, on both vSphere and Zen server is that I do not have any capability to do any type of encryption natively in the, in the hypervisor that would allow me to ensure that my live migration tra uh, traffic is secured. So what are organizations doing today? Typically, I'm dedicating a separate, I'm creating a separate port group. I have a separate physical interface for my live migration traffic, and that's ensuring that it's on a dedicated subnet. Right now, you can say, well, so what? You know, it's working fine, and that's true. But, you know, long term, if I'm thinking about things like converged Ethernet and running multiple network streams over a larger network pipe, then some of those considerations become a bit more important. And having some encryption capabilities, for example, for live migration traffic, then that is something that I want to think about. Uh, Hyper-V does have some uh, live migration traffic cap uh, encryption capabilities simply because I do have IPsec policies that I expose through the parent partition. So there is some native ways that I can do some IPsec encryption to ensure that I am securing my live migration traffic. Uh, physical security appliance integration. So this would mean having the capability to inspect network traffic, say, in the virtual network uh, for my VMs. So say if I have virtual machine to virtual machine network traffic that I want to inspect, say, as part of an intrusion detection system, then I would, I would want to be able to tap into that virtual network through, say, a physical uh, network security appliance. Now, both VMware and Citrix do have some capabilities that allow uh, that to happen. Uh, in the case of VMware, for example, I can use port spanning or on a third-party virtual switch, so i.e. the Nexus 1000V. I can also do things like um, I can use VLANs to force the VM traffic through the physical appliance, not always a recommended approach. I can use port groups and a dedicated interface uh, to mirror the virtual network traffic to a physical appliance. So in other words, with, a, with the port group architecture, I can create a one-way mirror in a VMware virtual switch, and that would allow me to mirror the virtual network traffic out to a physical appliance. Um, I do have some diagrams of what that looks like. I don't think I have them in this deck, so if you're interested, I can, I can give you some more of those details. And actually, I think, you know what, I do have some of those diagrams, but they're just a bit later in the presentation. Um, in, in the case of Microsoft Hyper-V R2, the only way I can do this is VLAN trunking uh, of the VM guest through the physical appliance. There, there's, not a, there's not a capability in, in Hyper-V today to do any kind of one-way mirroring of the virtual switch traffic. It's not in the core architecture, so I can't actually look inside a virtual switch, inspect the traffic, and see what's going on between different VMs. Okay, that's, it's, I, I can isolate the unicast traffic, but I can't actually do any type of one-way mirror. So what that means is if I want to actually inspect traffic, I have to force all the traffic out a, a physical interface to a physical device and then send it right back in to that same physical interface to, say, the target VM. And, of course, you know, that's going to pr uh, create a pretty heavy load on network I.O. So that's really the, the issue that exists there today. A security API for consumption by third-party products. Uh, so far, there's, there's one vendor that has that today, which is VMware with the VMSafe API. So again, that does give me some, some additional integration capabilities beyond what I have uh, in the core hypervisor. Uh, Citrix does not have that capability today with Zen or Zen Server. There's some early work underway in the Zen introspection project. Uh, and I have the link to that there in the deck. And just by the way, I mean, you can see that there are a lot of hyperlinks. If anybody's interested in the slide deck, just send me an email, and I'll be happy to give that to you, chris.wolf at gartner.com. I think I have that at, uh, at the end of the, the, the presentation as well. Uh, in the case of Hyper-V now for the security API, the answer is, again, no here. My Windows parent partition does include some security APIs that can monitor some host-level activities, but the API set is not capable of doing any VM guest-level monitoring. So there is some, uh, I don't have that, uh, that guest-level connection. Now, you know, just for background's sake on this one, this is, this is something that we've seen as, as a, as a uh, a real area of, of a lot of debate, uh, so much so that we had a, a company conference last month, and we wanted to bring up vendors to talk about the issues on stage. Because if you ask Microsoft and Citrix, and I have about, you know, do, are you going to have an equivalent to VM Safe? So far, the answer has been no. We're doing some other, they're doing some other things with security vendors, but it's not the same introspection architecture uh, that exists with VMware and VM Safe. So what we, had on, what we had on stage was Microsoft, Citrix, and VMware, and uh, some pretty opinionated folks talking about it. And, and the, basically, the net result of it was, was, as you would, I'm sure you're surprised here, the vendors did not agree on uh, 
on the way forward. So, you know, Microsoft and Citrix are still seeing a combination of host-based and network-based uh, security mechanisms to uh, inspect and enforce security policy. Uh, VMware is using that combination of introspection, and there are some avenues for host-based security as well, as well as some network-based security. That's, that's part of even the, if you've looked at some of the vShield uh, technologies that were announced this week, uh, you've seen that there. So, you know, there are vendors that are moving on different paths, and, and the, 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 tr the trick here for a lot of our clients has been, what do I do? You know, if, if I'm going to make a, a decision on security architecture and security products, I really need to make sure I'm, I'm doing the right one. And for a lot of our clients so far, the answer has been to wait. They've been, they've been in this holding pattern. They're not entirely convinced that even some of the VM safe appliances are mature enough for them to use. And again, don't get me wrong, there's, 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 there's vendors here on, on the show floor that have some very good products that, that have done okay. Altor, uh, for example, uh, has done very well. So it really depends on you know, which vendors you're working with, for example, as to how you're going to uh, move down that path. I just wanted to say that there's some pros and cons uh, either way there. Uh, Multi-factor authentication for the management server. Uh, VMware cannot do this natively. It is provided by uh, some third-party add-ons such as HiTrust. Uh, Citrix Zen Server does not offer it natively either. Uh, Microsoft Hyper-V does have native support to do multi-factor authentication to SCVMM. Uh, TPM support now. So being able to do trusted platform module uh, support for both the server, uh, the hypervisor, and for VM attestation. Uh, VMware vSphere 4 does not have TPM support at this time. Uh, for what it's worth, if some of you are at the RSA conference, uh, VMware did a uh, proof of concept with uh, both RSA as well as Intel showing a hardware root of trust so I can definitively and authoritatively say where a VM physically resides using uh, Intel TXT technology. So this is something that has been demonstrated publicly so far, but it's just not in the shipping product. So to me, that means it's coming. It's just not there yet in terms of the TXT support. Uh, Zen Server, again, uh, does offer some attestation for the hypervisor, but not for the virtual machine at this point. And if you haven't seen it, an interesting project that had gone on by IBM or some research they've done is virtual TPMs for Zen. And yes, I know the, the concept of a virtual TPM is, you know, kind of makes your head want to explode, but it's, a, it's an interesting paper, and I, I'd recommend reading it. I have the link there. Uh, Microsoft does have TPM support native to the parent partition. Uh, I can use that in combination with BitLocker to actually give me a secure OS boot as well as drive encryption. Uh, that can give me, uh, that can extend out to the actual virtual hard disk files as well. And I have the details there on the slide for the Hyper-V environments. Okay, uh, last of our optional features is uh, EAL common criteria certification. So far, this is a tricky one, right? Because I, I just could don't go show up and get an EAL common criteria four plus, right? This takes a long time. So in fairness to the vendors right now, uh, both VMware and Citrix are not certified in terms of their currently shipping project, uh, products, uh, but the certification process is underway, and that's why I included the, the links to those guys. Uh, in the case of Hyper-V, Windows Server 2008 with the Hyper-V role is EAL 4 plus uh, certified today. Okay, so that was a, a quick rundown of, you know, sizing up, you know, where VMware is at versus Citrix versus Microsoft. What I wanted to get into next is just a, a little bit of a diversion on client hypervisors, and I'm doing that simply because most folks have them internally. And by client hypervisors, what I'm talking about is Microsoft Virtual PC, VMware Workstation, for example, Sun Virtual Box or Oracle Virtual Box. These are all technologies folks use in-house, and a lot of times they, they take some of this for granted. The other area where uh, the Type 2 hypervisor is coming into play more is with the release of VMware View 4.5. Uh, with View 4.5, there's local mode virtual desktop support, which is effectively running a virtual desktop on a user endpoint system using a Type 2 hypervisor. So the issues that I'm exposing here are also going to be uh, exposed or, or potentially uh, there for a local mode desktop in a VMware View 4.5 environment. Okay, starting with, uh, with the good old rogue VMs, I don't know, I, I like the word rogue because it's, I don't know, I just like it, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a, effectively, it's an untrusted VM on a trusted system. We run into this a lot, but while we have technology and good technology already to, to deal with this in the data center, there's not a lot out there that can help me deal with rogue VMs and the presence of rogue VMs on user endpoint systems. 
Uh, I don't know if you have, have experienced this, but I've worked with uh, several organizations where they had, say, a developer, they uh, download a server OS, they put DHCP on it, and all of a sudden that they have a DHCP server handing out IP addresses to other developers, say, on their subnet. The net result of that is, is I have a bunch of users now that are offline, and they're calling the help desk, wondering why they can't connect to, say, their file shares and other resources on the network. It's effectively a denial of service that was unintentional by one of their peers. And that happens when you're letting your users just download server OSs and connect them to the LAN, you know, unchecked. And that's uh, what a lot of folks have today with uh, VMware Workstation or, you know, virtual PC uh, in their environments. So, so why do we care? Again, the unmanaged OS, this can, uh, this can be connected to the LAN. Uh, they, those unmanaged OSs are downloaded from the Internet. They have known accounts, known passwords. They're typically unlicensed and unpatched. To me, it's the equivalent of having a policy that would allow your users to build white box servers at home, just bring them into work and plug them into the LAN. Anybody doing that? Anybody letting people use uh, virtual PC and VMware Workstation to do stuff? The liars. You sure you are. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the problem here, right, I can be all ideological here, but the problem is, is politics. You know, you got users that have been using VMware Workstation since 2000. They've been using this thing, or even from 1999. They, they've been on this thing for 10, 11 years, and now all of a sudden you're going to say, no, you can't use it? I mean, that's, that's tough to do. Um, so, so just, again, talking about some of the problems, the other issue here is the capability to capture host traffic. The vendors don't usually talk about this, but if you look at the virtual switch architecture of any type 2 hypervisor, you are able to capture the host traffic. Uh, I can capture the host traffic and the traffic of any VM that's also connected to that, sharing that same interface. The reason for that is, whether I'm talking about VMware Workstation or VMware Player or Windows Virtual PC, none of the switches do any kind of unicast isolation. Effectively, they behave as hubs. Now, I know there's some Microsoft folks here, and hopefully they'll appreciate this. Uh, about uh, five years ago, I was working with Microsoft because I discovered this issue on Virtual Server 2005. And I said, you know, guys, your, your virtual switch and virtual server, it's not a switch, it's a hub. And I said, you know, here's some Wireshark captures, here's the proof of it. I'm not isolating any unicast traffic. And they said, no, you're wrong. It's a virtual switch. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? They said, it's a fully mirrored virtual switch. I said, oh. So, you know, that was a, that was a marketing guy just earning his keep that day. So, you know, I, I respected the answer. But again, this is, this, is, this is an ubiquitous problem. It's across the board. I've talked to other vendors that rely on that type 2 hypervisor like Mocha 5. They understand it too. And they've done some engineering work around that specific issue to provide greater levels of isolation. So just, uh, you know, nothing really says it more in terms of proof than like a blurry Wireshark screen capture, right, that you really can't see. So you kind of just have to trust me that I was able to capture some stuff here. Um, this is showing, uh, this is actually, you know, latest technology. This is using the virtual PC, virtual switch on Windows 7. That's when I did this capture. And what I was able to do is from one VM, I can capture the host traffic, and I can also capture the traffic of other VMs on that same Windows 7 host. So I was able to see everything going in and out of the host network interface, even if it wasn't destined for me, you know, uh, the VM. Uh, the way that you can get around that, actually, in Windows Virtual PC, if I put NAT on the network interface, I am able to... Uh, shield that virtual machine from actually being able to pick up and see the host traffic. So if I'm just bridging it right to the interface and that virtual machine's getting a, an IP address on my LAN right next to my physical desktop, uh, then I'm also going to be able to capture the traffic of the physical desktop too. If I use NAT, so my virtual machine is getting a private IP address and then I'm NATting that out to the physical LAN, uh, then I would have some isolation and I would not have those same uh, capturing capabilities. Now, with, with Windows 7, just a couple others here in terms of Windows 7 XP modes with the integration features. Uh, the good news is integration features can improve management and user experience, but the default VM has access to the host physical drives. So if you, you see there's a, a checkbox here under drives. I have local disk, C, D, E, et cetera. So I am going to have read access. Just if I'm turning on a new VM, the default is to give that VM full access to the local drives. So I just wanted to point that out while we're just having this little tangent here on the Type 2 hypervisors. Uh, the other thing that we have with integration features is they can give the guest a uh, applications access to the physical host. Uh, the bad news here is that they will use, uh, that, this, this, that uh, the integration features do give guest access uh, applications to the physical host. So almost sounds like the same thing, right? 
what, what one of my colleagues called this is almost a built-in VM escape. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a one-way communication pipe, but it is something that we've, uh, we've uh, just wanted to point out. And I have some more details here on the integration features. And it's really driven by technology Microsoft calls the virtual PC bus. This is a channel for host applications to directly communicate with the VM guest, which is kind of cool. I mean, this was put in there because Microsoft wanted to provide capability so organizations could have applications, say, in, in Windows XP mode for legacy support, but then I might want to have a management application on the host system uh, be able to go in inventory and manage that application in the VM guest. So that's why we have this, this secure pipe. This is being done via named pipes, but you can see it here. Now, just so you're aware, I can actually capture that traffic too. I've been able to do Wireshark captures, and I've been able to capture the name pipe communication over virtual PC bus. It actually uses an APIPA IP address, and that's how you'll be able to see it. Uh, BitLocker, this is, this is a good feature that's in, in Windows 7. This allows me to encrypt virtual hard disk files, so I can get greater, uh, greater granularity if I'm using Windows 7 virtual PC. Of course, I can use BitLocker as well on uh, VMware workstation v virtual machines as well. So this can give me so some capabilities to secure the actual virtual disk files. Now, how do we deal with these before we just get back to some cloud security best practices? Essentially, store all your VMs in the data center. That's, that's the best way to do it, using a lab management tool, say, to provision virtual machines to users. That gives me central control of the virtual machines, gives me central control of updating, patching, et cetera. You know, that's the idealistic view. If you can get users where they're just connecting to VMs, sharing them in the data center, that is far better than doing anything um, where I would offer that up uh, to allow users to do it locally. There's, there's several pro uh, products that would allow you to do that. I have them listed here. Uh, you can block type two hypervisors on the user endpoints. And there's plenty of tools that I can use to whitelist applications. Uh, that are authorized, so if, if I'm using them natively in-house, that's fine. Another tool you could use on the Windows side would be AppLocker, which I can uh, uh, configure via group policy, and I can blacklist or whitelist uh, specific applications. And that's, I have a couple of examples here, uh, blocking uh, the virtual PC.exe and uh, VMware.exe executables. How can we detect rogue virtual machines? There's some other tools that are available here, VMware vShield app has a default deny all policy, so virtual machines in the data center. I'm, I'm going to be able to make sure that only authorized virtual machines are starting and running. Uh, something I wrote several years ago that you might find useful is a domain audit virtual hard disk uh, uh, script. And, and what it does is it, it, it will uh, enumerate all the, the computers in the domain. It will then connect to each computer and just do an index of the file system. And what it's, what it's looking for is specific file types or, or files larger than a certain size. That was just something I had done several years ago because A, I don't have a life, and uh, B, there really wasn't anything dealing with it at the time. Uh, what else can we do to, to manage them at, at the client endpoint? Offer VMs from an IT central repository. We can strict VM access. So again, that would be you know, making sure that I'm, I'm centrally managing them. The central repository mean I'm using a product like VMware Ace, for example, to control the distribution and management. I can be using uh, Microsoft MedV to do that as well, or a product like Mocha 5 would give me that capability. So users are still running those desktops locally, but they have some capabilities uh, to, to make, ensure that they're secured. I want to restrict virtual machine access to select networks, and I can do that by simply disabling the network drivers on the host system. So that gives you some other capabilities to keep those systems off the LAN. OK, now let's get into some challenges and solutions here specific to server virtualization and private cloud. Uh, the first thing I want you to do, and, and I, I think you guys have seen some of this on the, on the floor already, is Diamond Shreddies. And you, you want to watch out for them, because there's, there's a lot of them out there. This, this happened several years ago where, where we, uh, you know, and it's just, maybe it's getting a little bit better, but you had security companies say, yep, you know, here's our security product, and now here it is for virtualization, right? Look, it's new and improved. It's better. You know, when in reality, you know, it was, it was a little bit misleading. And, and what I found when I've worked with some of these vendors is you have to really ask some specific questions to make sure that they are, uh, you know, doing what you think they are. There's, there's vendors out there that will say, look, you know, here's all the security I can do, and here's the policies that I can enforce, and look, I can do it on VMware, I can do it on Zen Server, I can do it on Hyper-V. And the question you have to ask them is, okay, well, specifically, what can you do on Zen Server? Or specifically, what can you do on Hyper-V? Because in many cases, it's not all the same. Each, as you saw in the strengths and weaknesses, each hypervisor has some different capabilities so that the, the ecosystem vendors are not able to do everything they say. 
Uh, inspecting network traffic on Hyper-V environments is very difficult uh, because of the lack of port spanning capabilities in the virtual switch architecture. So that's just an example of, of how I'm, I'm limited in what I can do. Now, from, from a reference architecture perspective, this just shows you uh, encapsulating uh, workloads into virtual data centers, and this is something that, again, I can spend all day talking about reference architecture and, and put you to sleep. I'm not going to do that, but we have a, I think this is about a 20-page document that we have that talks about infrastructure as a service and, and the architecture that many of our clients are building towards. Now, what you see in here is something that has been a work in progress, really, for some of our clients. They're not there yet, but what they're working towards is building out encapsulated virtual data centers that include not just the, the, the applications, but virtual machines that are tied to those applications, uh, networking resources, perhaps, uh, or at least uh, uh, virtual VLANs that are extending into that virtual network uh, infrastructure. I might also have some security appliances as well that are part of that uh, virtual data center. So that gives me the capability to take an entire service, run it in my internal cloud. I can then move that to an external cloud. I'm going to have the same security controls in place if I'm using some virtual security appliances to make that happen. Now, just running, running through this quickly again, talked about the virtual uh, data center. This is just some information. What are some of the things in there? Uh, one or more virtual machines. We have distributed switches, routers, firewalls, WAN accelerators, application delivery, controllers, IPS, IDS can be there as well. And again, this is something that we've seen as more of a work in progress among many of the vendors, but a lot of our clients that had been looking at physical security appliances are now looking at the virtual equivalents. Now, this can really put you to sleep here, so I'm just going to spend a, a, a few seconds on this. Uh, I talked about this a little bit more in, in one of my sessions yesterday, and that's our internal cloud maturity model. And what I wanted to talk about is, is just how organizations are typically moving through different phases of maturity. And where, where, some, where security is really starting to get in is when they're getting further closer to cloud, where they're worried about uh, things like multi-tenancy and being able to run multiple virtual machines, for example, uh, perhaps in different security zones on the same shared physical infrastructure. That is where I need much better virtualized security controls that I can use to uh, ensure that I am, say, compliant, for example, on that multi-tenant infrastructure. Now, if you look at what the typical organization is doing today, I'm going to... Uh, move into that in a second, is that you know, for mo many organizations, they have a, uh, for, for, for satisfying their auditors, what they're doing is still working with uh, physical separation of security zones. I don't have a lot of clients, for example, that are mixing resources in the DMZ on the same shared physical infrastructure as an internal trusted zone. Instead, they're, they're still uh, insistent on physical separation of some of those security boundaries. Now, now, some problems that we have here to deal with this is, is, a, is a natural disconnect that we have between the security folks and the operations folks. Now, if I look at this from an operations perspective, this is probably a fail, right? Because if, if somebody needs help, that life buoy, I'm not going to be able to get it for them. But if I look at it from a security perspective, that's not a fail, that's a win. You know, because that's not going anywhere. And if you relate it to how we're, where we're moving with cloud today, this is, this is kind of where a lot of organizations are at. Because they're using physical security, they're using physical isolation to separate security zones, and the result is I have a lot of small ESX clusters, for example, that I'm using for each security zone, and I don't get to have the maximum efficiency that I would get of shared physical infrastructure. Now, I'm going to get into, in, in a second, where organizations are at practically to, to deal with some of this. But I, I want to start by talking about infrastructure transparency, because I hear this quite a bit, too. When people are talking about cloud and security, they say, well, you know what, all I really have to care about is the app and the SLA. If the provider gives me the virtual resources I need, why do I care about the hardware? Well, there's some reasons why we need to care about the hardware. Low-level features can impact performance and security, um, such as Intel EPT, uh, as well as AMD uh, RVI technology. That's, that's a performance issue. I'm not going to get into that here. But Intel TXT, for example, allows me to establish a hardware root of trust. So if I'm concerned about things like data export restrictions in the cloud, I need to know where my virtual machine is physically at a given time. So in order for me to be able to query that information authoritatively, I need to have that hardware root of trust established. And that's where, again, this is a feature that's exposed by the underlying server hardware technology. I need to know that a service provider is capable of delivering that. Just telling me you can give me a VM with a couple of virtual CPUs and 8 gigs of RAM isn't necessarily enough. I need to make sure I can enforce security policy there. 
Now, just so you're aware, a shortcoming that exists with any solution today that's even proposed is I have the capability to identify where my applications are being processed. So where my, my VM physically resides with Intel TXT technology, I am able to determine where that DM is at and I can authoritatively determine that. But what I can't do right now is the data. If I want to answer the question, where is my data, you know, prove to me where my data is at, I don't have that information. I don't have an equivalent of TXT right now offered by the storage vendors that would allow me to establish an equivalent route of trust for data in the cloud. So th this is a conversation I've had with some storage vendors. Uh, it's something they understand that they need to do, it's just not there yet. You might say, you know, get a life here. Why is that so important? I work with a lot of clients that they're very concerned about data export restrictions. I, I spent a lot of time this summer in Canada and several Canadian organizations said, you know what, because of the US Patriot Act, we don't want any data south of the border. So we wanna make sure that our data is, is staying within the confines of say our, our country. In some cases, we wanna make sure our data is staying within the confines of our province. So this comes up a lot in other parts of the world too. And to be able to you know, easily move wor workloads to the cloud and make it make it realistic for our auditors to be able to determine compliance, these are some of the controls that I need. The other thing that we've talked about quite a bit, and you've seen this in some of the proof of concepts, is standard security models for cloud infrastructure. So RSA unveiled this uh, earlier this year at their conference. They had a, a, a platinum, gold, and silver type tiers of, of uh, technologies. And uh, I have a link for the Cloud Security Alliance because they're doing some work here too, but just as a basic level, for example, having levels such as dedicated physical infrastructure, virtual infrastructure, dedicated uh, server network storage, I might bump that down a level where I'm still using dedicated physical infrastructure, but I'll share a, I'll, or excuse me, shared physical infrastructure, but I'll use a dedicated LUN on the SAN. I might go down another layer where I'm, I'm sharing virtual and physical uh, infrastructure that I'm using isolation by dedicated virtual security appliances. And then one more level down, I can share my uh, virtual and physical infrastructure, but I won't have any appliance-based segmentation. So you get kind of the ideas here. We, we need to have some, some basic levels of service when it comes to security. And ideally, I want to have some consistency here. So if I'm talking about an application either hosted internally or externally in the cloud, if my auditor says, you know, right now I'm just most comfortable with physical isolation, well, okay, then I know which uh, security model I need, say, at least for that service or a particular zone. This is, just, uh, this is just graphically illustrating that. Again, uh, what we've seen, again, if I have like an internal trusted zone in a DMZ, many of our clients will use uh, full physical separation. But there are some ways where we can, we can take that a little bit, uh, a little bit more granular. I'm gonna, I have some slides that cover that in a second, but just to talk about what people are doing that don't wanna just have full physical separation. They'll try to treat their, their ESX environment or their Hyper-V environment like a IBM LPAR. So what they'll do is they'll, 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 they'll segment it, they'll try to segment zones within a cluster, but they'll ensure that each zone, for example, has its own virtual switch, which then gives us its own physical network port. I'll make sure on the back end it has its own physical LUN as well. So while I'm technically sharing the physical hardware, my I.O. is isolated in both directions. So my network I.O. is isolated because it's on a dedicated physical switch, and, uh, or excuse me, dedicated virtual switch in physical NIC port or ports. And then on the SAN side, I have the same idea. I'm using a dedicated LUN on the SAN. So that gives me a, a step towards multi-tenancy. For many organizations, it's an easier first step to take rather than just you know, going all in on multi-tenancy. So, and and for, for many clients I've worked with, that's been, that's been okay and agreeable to their auditors. Talked about this a little bit already in terms of are you managing network traffic or are you, are you aware of it? For many organizations, this is something that they're, they're, they're currently blind to. They're, they're not seeing how much uh, traffic or, or what exactly is traversing between VMs. You know, with the, the concern here that if a VM is compromised, I could use it to launch an attack on another VM, and that traffic would go unnoticed. So I wouldn't have any, any part of my monitoring infrastructure be able to capture that type of uh, traffic. So, you know, what's the issue here? This can be difficult to capture with a physical appliance because it would require VLAN uh, trunking to force the VM to VM traffic to traverse the physical infrastructure. Uh, that's, today, as I mentioned, that's the only option for Hyper-V. I would expect future releases to address that uh, issue and, and give you the capability to span ports in a virtual switch. If we bring in the VM appliance, we can do this a little bit differently. I can integrate with my existing vSwitch architecture. It could be a standard vSwitch, distributed virtual switch, uh, Nexus 1000V. It could also be open vSwitch in Zen environments. Uh, the catch here with this architecture, I would, I would probably require it on every physical host or every host where I want to monitor the traffic. So what I'm doing here is I'm configuring a promiscuous mode switch port. This is just a low level administrative configuration. 
and I would set it up as a, as a one-way mirror uh, to con or just connect that port to, say, the virtual machine appliance. Some of the vendors that are out on the show floor, when they did early network traffic inspection report in virtualization environments, this was the architecture they used. I had a dedicated port group. I enabled port mirroring on that port group. I connected the, the, my monitoring appliance to that VM, and then all I had to do was ensure that I had that, that appliance VM on every host in the cluster. Uh, this is the introspection architecture uh, that was uh, you know, first publicized with, v with VMSafe. VMware is, is uh, changing gears a little bit with, with some of the vShield products that they've uh, just introduced at the conference here. I'm going to talk about those in a second. So again, what I have here is I'd have a security appliance virtual machine that, that manages my security policies. I do have a direct path to the hypervisor, and I can do some guest level inspection as well uh, with that particular architecture. OK, just to get in now, just to summarize with some, some uh, security best practices, for virtual infrastructure configuration, you want to use native uh, and third-party features to satisfy our hypervisor security criteria. Again, those were all the tables that I had at the very beginning of the presentation. You want to implement an audit for recommendations in the vendor security hardening guidelines. I have them all listed here. Again, I would suggest you, you take a look at those depending on the hypervisor or hypervisors that you're running internally. For zoning and physical isolation, again, I, I mentioned this already. I just, just to summarize, what many organizations are using right now is separate physical clusters to isolate security zones, such as their DMZ and internal trusted zones. I can use internal subzones uh, on shared physical infrastructure. And then, again, the level of isolation might, might uh, depend on the sensitivity of the data. So, for example, for some organizations, I can do subzone isolation at the VLAN level, and that's, that's adequate. Uh, for others, I'll use dedicated virtual and physical switches. Uh, with physical NIC ports and back-end storage. So again, that means I have a virtual switch for each zone. I associate that virtual switch with a physical NIC port or a pair of ports. And uh, again, that gives me some network layer isolation. And then on the storage side, I would give that, uh, members of that zone a dedicated LUN on the SAN. Again, I mentioned so far enterprises are mixing zones on a shared server infrastructure. They might be using host-based security and planning to add some network-based security and then dedicating network uh, and storage resources to each of those security zones. So again, I, that gives me a, a step towards multi-tenancy, but it's not such a far leap that I have, again, all my zones on the same uh, uh, physical cluster with really no other isolation uh, technologies that are, that are separating them. Now, how do we solve the network traffic inspection dilemma? If I want visibility into network traffic in the virtual infrastructure, there's a few ways that I can do this. I can use host-based security. Again, that's a consistent method to monitor, audit, and audit enforce security regardless of the underlying physical or virtual infrastructure. Again, I can, that's something that I can do on any hypervisor. Using, some of you may know if you're in a pure VDI environment, using uh, just host-based security can be pretty disruptive and, and uh, can really degrade performance. Anybody, anybody deploy virtual desktops in here? Anybody run antivirus software in the virtual desktops? How'd that work out? All right. Uh, that's, that's, that's why, um, again, that's why vendors are, are working on better offload technologies. You've seen it uh, with Citrix with Zen Desktop. VMware is doing the same thing with partnerships with uh, both McAfee, uh, Trend. Uh, Citrix is doing the same thing with those vendors. Uh, your, Microsoft is, is working with those vendors as well to have more intelligent offload where I can, I can offload as much as I can, say, to, to an appliance that might be uh, scanning a shared virtual desktop image, and then... All that I'm worried about now is just doing some real-time AV scanning within the guest OS. It's a much cleaner solution uh, than, than what's existed today with the virtual desktop environments. So again, you've, you've seen, uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't checked it out in, in, on the show floor, I would, I would recommend you do take a look at vShield App and vShield Edge. Uh, vShield App is my distributed virtual firewall. vShield Edge is my edge firewall for each virtual data center. And again, I just have some of the capabilities of vShield Edge there. One of my favorite phrases with, uh, with cloud providers is, we're SaaS 70 compliant. And when they tell me that, I have three letters I tell them. I say BFD. Great. Uh, it's, congratulations on your self-audit SaaS 70 compliance, guys. But you know, what's more important is that they share the results of the audit with you. You want to see specifically what they're auditing. Okay? It's, it's, it's just, just to have their own self-certification doesn't really carry a lot of weight. It doesn't necessarily imply any type of security that uh, your organization may be comfortable with. So you want to ask the provider for audit details. Uh, they will provide that. If it's, again, if you're, if you're looking at a large enough implementation, that is information that they will share with you. 
Uh, not all PCI auditors are going to accept shared physical infrastructure as adequate separation. There's some providers I work with that say, you know what, if, if, if I'm worried about PCI compliance, I'm going to give you dedicated physical infrastructure, period. Because I don't want there to be any, any question in terms of security and liability. There's other providers out there, and some are, some are exhibiting on the show floor today, that say, nope, multi-tenant shared infrastructure, no problem, PCI compliant, go for it. You know, your tenants might be whoever, you know, hackers.com, but, uh, you know, from PCI perspective, you're good to go. You know, that scares, that scares a lot of auditors. So you need to be, just because the provider says they're PCI compliant, you still want to really check with your auditor to ensure that that's, that's acceptable too. So a lot of providers are, are taking standards and they're, they're doing a good job, but just, just again, you want to make sure that your internal folks are, are comfortable there too. Metadata that identifies physical data location and VM runtime location is required. Again, this is something that uh, I mentioned earlier. RSA, Intel, the VMware concept can identify the VM, uh, but not the data today. Again, where the data physically resides. We could take a guess. Maybe it's in the same rack as the VM, and maybe that's okay, but I can't definitively say where the data is at right now. Uh, virtual data centers will aid our, our virtual machine mobility to the cloud, so it's something to plan for. Our virtual appliance management belongs to the specialist, so i.e. the network and security admins. So again, I, you know, I, my, my virtualization admins or my server admins, they can provision VMs when they're given a port group, but my network admins should be managing, say, the Cisco Nexus 1000V, not a server admin. Those would be the guys that are enforcing the network security on those devices. Uh, you know, ditto for the security admins. Those would be the ones that are managing any, any uh, security appliances that I bring from physical network infrastructure into virtual network infrastructure. Key management, your enterprises, not your providers, should be holding and managing the keys. So most folks are not comfortable with letting the provider manage their keys for security. They, they want the enterprise, they want to be able to maintain that information locally. Um, infrastructure authority is something I have a presentation on a little bit. Actually, it's next. It's going to come up in, I think, about 30 minutes, so I, I won't spend a lot of time on it here. But one of, one of the disconnects we've seen and, and where we, we've worked with a few vendors on is the idea that so far, if I'm trying to orchestrate or move virtual machines around, there's nothing that's, there's, there's nothing that's checking policy constraints against automation. So if I have data export restrictions, for example, or if I have separation requirements, or if I have other operational issues uh, such as backup that would require a VM to be in, in a certain physical data center to be close to a particular storage array, I, can't, I don't have the capability to check some of those policy constraints before I deploy a virtual machine today. And, and that's what this concept is about, is being able to map dependency maps uh, to virtual machines so I can ensure that a virtual machine is going in the right place. Okay, just to wrap this up, again, this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, you know, I'm an analyst, right? So I have to hedge. So there you go. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It depends. Uh, developing organizational standards models for security and service levels helps private cloud transparency. That's something I, I feel very strongly about. I want to be able to have consistency. So if I, have a, if I set up a, a service model that identifies, say, availability levels, uh, recovery time objectives, and recovery point objectives, and security requirements, I like to be able to, to, to take those models, be able to use them internally. If I'm using public cloud resources, I would prefer to be able to carry those over and have similar, uh, similar architecture or similar support by the service provider. Uh, the virtual data center it, as an isolation security boundary will be broadly accepted, we feel, over the next two to five years. We, we, the virtual data center is inevitable, so physical separation is something that folks will become more and more comfortable with over time. Network access layer appliances and storage infrastructure should be built with the virtual data center in mind. And our core hypervisor features, such as traffic inspection capabilities uh, and enterprise uh, security software integration, are major differentiators. You do want to look at that when you're assessing uh, the different vendor solutions. It's never just about the strength of the core hypervisor. You know, that's important, but it's really the ecosystem that's around it and all the other operational stuff that you need for the virtual environment. Last thing, the tools are there, guys, but they have to be used as the vendor intended. So we have a lot of innovation right now in networking and infrastructure as a service and in security, but again, you have to look at how the vendors want you to use those tools, and that does require some organizational and process change. So with that, I, there's my contact information, and if anybody has any questions, just please, we have a microphone on each side. I'd, prefer, I'd appreciate it if you'd go to the microphone. If uh, you don't feel like doing that and you really have a question, fine, just say it, and I'll repeat it up here. Sure. Yeah, there are other certifications coming that are, they're going to have more teeth. And, and even, um, uh, uh, go ahead. Do you want, you want to go to the microphone? 
It's right behind you. I was saying, isn't the um, SAS 70 going to be replaced by the ISAE? And if, it, you know, and if so, is that what we should be asking in terms yeah, of audit? Yeah, I, I think that you should. And, and the bottom line is what you're, what you're really asking for is transparency. You know, it's, uh, you know, for a provider to say we're secure because we say that we are and you have to trust us is not enough. I mean, a lot of our clients that are looking at, if, if I'm looking at non-critical, you know, dev test resources where I don't have private data, I, I don't care, and I can pay for a cheaper level of service, and that's fine, but if I'm talking about production or workloads, critical data, then you need to go to the provider, you need to ask for that level of transparency, and, and that's the important thing. You want, you want specific details on their architecture, on their separation, and again, if you push them hard enough, there are some providers that, uh, that will do that for you. If the provider says, you know, pack sand, then, you know, go somewhere else. I mean, that, that's what I would recommend, because some are not being very uh, forthcoming. And I mean, the other thing that providers do that, that Im impacts availability is they have a very liberal definition of an outage. You know, for some providers, an outage is defined as anything more than five minutes. You know, ex explain that one to your users. No, you know, yeah, the, the server was down for a little bit, but it's not an outage, guys. It doesn't count. Do over. You know, see how, you know, see how that flies. So there's, you know, at the, it's, it's, at the end of the day, right, I mean, the certifications are important. And again, a lot of providers are going through PCI audits and they're, and they're getting better. Uh, and that's, that's very important, but, you know, the transparency to me is the most important thing. Uh, one more question over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, TriCypher, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, when we, uh, I didn't show it here, but earlier this year we did evaluation criteria for hosted virtual desktops. And... In that evaluation criteria, we had, we had a feature called uh, horizontal application scaling. And what we were talking about is the fact that not all organizations are going to use just virtual desktops. They're going to use, say, ZenApp applications. They're also going to use software as a service. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm trying to string together all these different application delivery mechanisms and, and bring it all under the same management umbrella. And what TriCypher does is it really completes the whole picture for VMware. So with the Horizon product, what I'm able to do now with View Desktops is I can connect users to SaaS applications, right? I can connect them. They didn't show it on stage, but the capability is there. I can connect them to published apps in ZenApp, my ZenApp farm. I can connect them to, you know, their local applications, et cetera, all through a single sign-on. Um, and what you, what you saw in the announcement was several of the, service, the SaaS providers that are already part of the program. So Google Apps is there, Salesforce is there, for example. So I'm able to get all of that with single sign-on capabilities. So for, for virtual desktops, to me, it, it's a big deal. Uh, I would expect, um, you know, obviously there, there's other vendors in the space like Microsoft and Citrix. I would expect that, that they'll offer similar capabilities uh, sometime in the future. I would imagine that since VMware has now made that announcement, uh, those vendors would be more transparent about what some of those, their plans are in the space too. I mean, a lot of folks, when they're thinking about virtual desktops, they want to, they know that not, there's not a fully complete solution that does everything they want today, but they're trying to pick, make, place a bet on a vendor. So even if a vendor is not doing something exactly or does it all the way, just knowing where they're going and having some of that confidence is important. I think we have time for one more question. Is it over here? On, um, I, I have no idea which slide you were talking about. In terms of, I mean, both hypervisors can do VLAN trunking. Where I called out Hyper-V was the fact that it doesn't have uh, any type of uh, port mirroring capabilities in the virtual switch architecture. So because I can't actually span a port, so I have a VM connected to a port in the virtual switch, I can't just connect that another switch port, say, to either a physical interface that I'm tapping or to, say, just a virtual appliance that's managing traffic. My only choice with the Hyper-V architecture is to do use VLAN trunking and, and force my network traffic out to a physical security appliance to monitor it. I mean, our, our customers that are, are deploying Hyper-V today, they don't care. They're not, they're not worried about that level of security and, and traffic inspection in their Hyper-V environment, so it's not a big deal to them. You know, if I'm, if I'm evolving and I'm worried about multi-tenant cloud infrastructure in a Hyper-V environment, then those types of controls become more important. Uh, but right now, it's just, uh, again, you know, Microsoft is, is moving pretty quickly with Hyper-V, and they, there's, there's, they're doing things in a certain order, which makes sense. It's based on customer requirements. That one's just further down the list. We have time, I think, for, for at least one more question. Go ahead. You want to go to the microphone? Thanks. So in terms of
terms of performance and extensibility, how will the different hypervisors compare? First with performance, second is extensibility for like say partners building solutions on it. Oh boy. Uh, oh, that's a, wow. Oh, great question. Great question. Performance and extensibility. I mean, there's a lot out there already on performance. Uh, there's a lot of independent benchmarks, for example. Uh, Project Virtual Reality Check did a good job on virtual desktop workloads, for example, um, in those environments. Uh, Network World did some pretty good benchmarking as well, uh, comparing Hyper-V and uh, Zen Server, uh, Zen on Novell, uh, as well as VMware vSphere. Uh, there are some similarities. Uh, vSphere 4.1 has a, has a lot of performance enhancements, which I think might give them a slight edge. But it's, you know, raw performance for a lot of workloads, they're, they're, they're not very far apart from what I've seen with how our customers are using them. Uh, in terms of management, uh, there, there's a, there is a difference there. Uh, some feedback I've given VMware on the vCenter architecture is right now it's, it's plug-in only, uh, which means that say I'm a, I'm a management vendor or I'm a security vendor, and like I talked about some of the limitations of DRS. If I wanted to be able to have DRS behave differently because of other things that I'm doing, other probes and uh, monitors I'm doing, I, I can't because uh, VMware vCenter does not allow you to extend the database schema to change the DRS behavior. So partners are, are kind of handcuffed. Uh, if you compare that to the Microsoft architecture with System Center, it's actually not the case. Ops Manager does have an extensible architecture, and it is, it is possible for uh, third-party vendors to do custom controls and integrate that with System Center. Um, so it, it is a pretty significant architectural difference, at least today, between the two management platforms. I mean, I've given that feedback to VMware, and I'm not sure because of how Virtual Center is architected, if they'll get to that capability, they might wind up implementing that type of extensibility somewhere else further upstream, uh, such as uh, vCloud Service Director would be a, a possibility, you know, being their orchestration layer. And, you know, Ops Manager is, you know, a good ops management tool uh, equivalent to Microsoft. You know, uh, SCVMM, if you want to compare that to uh, vCenter, is not extensible uh, either. Um, you know, it's, 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 it has a more rigid framework, but again, you know, in big picture, at least capabilities today, um, uh, System Center Ops Manager is extensible. There is other things I can do. Uh, the Pro Tips integration is something that is in SCVMM. Uh, vCenter does not have, they have a plugin architecture, which is good, and they've done very well with, uh, with vendors being able to snap into that, but again, because I can't do any type of schema changes, then, you know, that's, uh, that's it. Um, I, think that's, uh, I think that's about it. Um, if anybody wants to take questions offline, you know, I'll, I'll be available for, for a little bit. Thank you very much.